warmly welcome you back to ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. Uh, we are in the 329th. We were rounding it up uh, when we were leaving the, um, the, 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 the previous format. We said it's 333 to make it very, very catchy, but it's in fact 329. So we are reconvening with uh, reminding us how important architectural criticism is. And if we can go to the first slide, uh, the last time we were wrapping up, um, we were um, uh, UJ uh, Fidel, my guest today, uh, and me is Martin Despang. Um, you asked me to go on a rant, a ramp, and uh, and plow through the slides. And when we do that, we knew there were some things we were missing on and some things there was almost a claim for correction. And that's what we want to start out with today and also clarify certain things. And we want to talk about intentions. The name of the show is um, very uh, Lewis carroll once again. Uh, it's called Capital Concentration, which I learned from you, Jay. And I added cash cropping. So that's both of us stitching together the name of the show. And the question is, what runs us when we look at architecture, when we look at the built environment? Is it money or is it something else and above and beyond it? And that's needless to say what we would prefer, because in these days, money runs it too much. And so we want to, this one here we were skipping over. This is at the very top right on this first slide is um, our monograph, which we were thinking its author, uh, Chris van Uffelen. And I want to add here that Chris is one of the most busy, as you can see on the left uh, column of this slide here. This is what he pops out. So there's lots of architectural books that, that he's doing. And that's how we got to know him. But uh, the, the more important part of the story has to do with the traffic light at the very bottom right, um, which is when Chris uh, called us into his office, which is in Stuttgart. And uh, by the way, we are now uh, doing this show from the opposite ends of the world. Jay, me back in Germany at after midnight and you a little bit afternoon because we have 12 hours time difference. And so um, I'm here near Munich, and uh, Chris van Ophelen is near Stuttgart, where currently uh, we couldn't really go because we we're close to having in the southern part of Germany, which is close to a century flood, uh, heavy rain, torrential rain, and lots of um, problems uh, resulting from that. So going to Stuttgart would be uh, a challenge. But if we would do it, we would go to Chris's office, which he asked us to do, and he basically said, hey, I have a question for you guys. So um, the question is that he says, uh, as of now in the world of architecture and the architectural world of architectural communication, it's all based on uh, basically capital concentration, your term, Jay. And it's about who important and famous are architects. And if they reach a certain level, they're worth for traditional publishers to get books out. And then, you know, they put them out on the bookshelves of the, well, there used to be bookstores, which is now changing all to digital, but there still are. And the publisher wants to be on the safe side to make sure they're not sitting there and getting old and sour. So that basically cuts out all the, you know, the firms that are ambitious and small and upcoming or, you know, just different and don't have that sort of attention quantitatively, but as Chris said, deserve it qualitatively. So he basically then uh, introduced us. It was supposed to be a secret, but it's not anymore because we're sharing it with the world here now, Jay and the audience. He showed us two servers in, in, his, in, his, in his editorial office, huge ones, because you're now, Jay, you know, operating this from home. So I'm pretty sure you got to have you know, the equipment and you have the equipment as well to handle all that. And he has to handle all these. I sent you these slides up front and we're saying, okay, we couldn't send them by email. We had to go with, we transfer and UH file drop. So this adds up, right? Show after show, people send you that, or I will send you more of these. So he needs these huge servers. And he said, the secret is now that I have a red server and I have a green server. 
the Red server is all these big uh, architectural offices that got famous. But he said, here's my point. The fame got into their brain and got arrogant and full of themselves. And it's pain in the butt to work with them. But the audience, the readers, the buyers want them. So I have to deal with them um, no matter what. It's part of that capital concentration we're talking about. But then he says, I have the green server, which is people who also do good work. But in fact, um, they're still nice. And I prefer to work with them. But again, because of capital concentration, the audience wants to primarily see the other ones, the famous ones, these star architects, as we like to call it. So he said, there's something wrong with that. And he said, I want to, I have an idea and I want to use that's interesting for you. I know as Think Tech Hawaii, as it started out with technology, technology in the printing sector of bookmaking has changed from analog to digital. And the print on demand um, technology, which is basically uh, printing digitally, allows you to basically print small series of, of books. Uh, and you don't have to put out, you know, 10,000s of them and then, you know, sit on them on the bookshelves. But you can actually print on demand, as it says, as many as you basically want or if there, as there is a demand. And he said, I, I want to invite you as the ones I like the most from the green ones. And we said, thank you very much. Goes both ways. And we did this publication as a prototype. Um, and so that's that's the point that we want to make. Uh, you know, we talk about human humane architecture. So you got to have human humane architects, right? And you got to come from the heart. And um, if you do that, that's the point. Uh, maybe that's going to help, you know, the built environment. Um, if you do it not with uh, profit in mind, primarily, but with coming from you know, doing things that you believe that really matter. How does that sound to you, Jay? And by the way, I provoke you here because I also put you in here. For me, not the native English speaker, will never be, have never been. Um, I always wanted to know, why is Jay walking? So where does that term Jay walking come from? And, and now we read in the news here on Hawaii Public Radio, as we quote there at the bottom right, that now Jay is is allowed to walk again if he watches for the traffic and and feels safe he can actually go <laughs> versus before when that red thing says red you know you got to stop and I think one of the mayors recently um, was then you know initiating that thirty dollars fine if you didn't do that right so now. So where where does did you ever think about being Jay? Where that jaywalking came from as a term? You know, I, I grew up in New York, and everybody jaywalks in New York. Is it? It's you know, there's uh, millions of jaywalkers in New York. And when I came to Hawaii, you know, local people told me you can't do that here. <clears throat> that doesn't you know you have to follow the rules. You can't step off the curb. You know, if the light the don't walk light is is red. And so I, I don't know the answer. I wish I, I did. Perhaps later I will re research this and find out and we can discuss it. But for now, all I can say is that over the past 50 years, or is it 60, I have learned not to jaywalk. So the association between my name and my conduct at intersections has changed. Fair enough. <laughs> So talking claims of correction here, next slide to the second slide. This is uh, that what we love is when the audience gives us feedback. Either way, you know, we love it. And so here was um, our idol, Kurt Sandburn, who um, has been, and we want to believe continues to be our most architectural critic on the island. Um, has gotten back and says, hey, guys, interesting, you know, and thanks for involving, you know, incorporating me into this. And then I'm going to read it here, what we see on the left side of, the, of that slide here. He says, not to mention your assertion that I have big balls in brackets. I do actually. Exactly. That's what we no, you, <laughs> how we know you, uh, Kurt. My only quibble, my developer father never sued me. We just had heated dinner table conversations 
And as I think I told you, yes, you did, that once sent an embarrassing letter to the Honolulu City Council at the height of the Sandy Beach battle. Do you recall, Jay, what the Sandy Beach battle was? Mm, absolutely, I do. Yeah. It's got to be 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was a notable controversy about about urban planning. Yeah. So it was, I mean, my, and you tell me because you witnessed it. I wasn't there yet. Um, needed 20 more years for me to come. But Kurt told me, and hopefully I'm going to get this right now, so he doesn't have to do another claim of correction, uh, that he said it was Henry J. Kaiser, the great aluminum tycoon who fell in love with Hawaii after he retired from everything else. And his wife didn't like it. Similarly, she kind of hated it. And so he tried his very best and painted all the construction equipment pink, her favorite color. And then he did things as Hawaii Kai, uh, which Kai stands for Kaiser. And he um, it then took on and um, it, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And as of now, uh, when we go around the island uh, going um, basically um, east, we don't see it creeping up on the beach, on Sandy Beach. And that's thanks to Kurt, because at some point, they wanted to basically hover over the berm there. And Kurt basically, as uh, we then negotiated with him, how he wanted to be called in his show, which was one of the very first ones. At the bottom left here, the show quote, whenever you see the number, that's why YouTube and your legacy archive does it. When you see the number getting bigger, 324, that means... As I said, we're now in 329, so this was the fifth uh, show we ever did, and he wanted to be called uh, activist journalist. And so he went up and basically took that project down and made sure it never happened, but um, it caused some friction with his developer dad, but it didn't get quite to the point that I over-exaggerated here. But that's, again, when you come from passion, right? And again, Kurt, we will not give up to try to get you back at some point. Jay, you kindly tried as well a little while ago. And I will keep on trying because, again, um, you're just too good. Your writing is just too you know, perfect to, to not be read anymore, to not be heard. And at the bottom right here, I, I, I added to basically... Um, have the last pieces you wrote was actually for um, for the, these are the ones for Civil Beat and after that you wrote for Hanaho the um, Hawaiian Airlines magazine but these ones for Civil Beat uh, were the ones that you were doing after the ones that we agreed that probably shut you up which was uh, digging out dirt about the ritzy glitzy Carlton in Waikiki at the bottom right but. You did a couple other ones, and the very last one you did was about us, the School of Architecture, and the, you were putting the finger in the wound of saying, hey, you you know, students, you can be so creative in school. How about that creativity when you get out of school and you try to get jobs on the island? And his point was, which is well taken, which is pretty much in the hands of few big firms uh, and that could come across as almost mafia-like, that you have some clans who basically make sure uh, no other ones are going to mess with their monopoly that they have. To me, I think the, the role of architecture as, um, as an art form um, is to reflect the wishes of the community, to build a better community. To engage, um, you know, in a sort of conversation between the people who live in the community, so they have a better place, and so that the design professionals are listening to them. Um, in a sense, the architects are representatives of that, and their burden is to find out what people want, um, to um, you know, design communities that are optimal, uh, that that provide for a quality of life. Um, that is the best that can possibly be um, for these individuals. And, you know, there are two factors that enter into that. One is the 
desire of the architects to do creative things, to go outside the box, to explore the creative possibilities going forward. They should. Um, but with due regard for the wishes of the community and how far can you stretch those wishes um, in the direction of creativity. And the other one, which is actually more difficult, um, is, is the capital concentrations, as you mentioned, <clears throat> because you have people who want to make a buck, uh, want a net profit, um, and they don't care really about about architecture or the um, the, the the wish of the community to live well, and so um, they they are they are a problem, and so you have to control what they want to do. Now we have um, designated and arranged for various planning departments to put a, a control on on the capital concentration so it doesn't get out of hand. And query, you know, have they done their job? When I think of some communities around the country and the world, I say that is beautiful. What has happened, for example, in so many places in Europe, to walk down the street is a joy. And um, the way the architecture is designed, the way the street is designed, it's a beautiful thing. It's not only aesthetically beautiful, it's beautiful in terms of its um, satisfaction of the, the needs of the individual residents to enjoy their, their, their daily life. Um, and I think in many places in the U.S. and elsewhere, um, you know, these things have been fragmented. Uh, the capitalists get what they want. They get their profit. They get tall buildings that are not particularly, you know, designed for individual residents and occupants. Um, and, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, the architects are unable to resist that capital demand. You know, I, I know that architects uh, do value value engineering um, because they are told to. It was like an appraiser um, where the client says to the appraiser, uh, I want you to find X million value here. That's not really honest. Uh, the appraiser should be left to do what he does best, appraise. Um, and it's the same thing with architects. The architects should be left to do, to do what they do best design and reflect the values and aspirations of the community. So what I'm saying is I suggest that the connection between the architect and the community may be frayed by the capital concentrations and and uh, and the, um, the the planning the planning departments around the world have likewise been frayed by the capital contribution contributions, um, who may who may corrupt them, who may make demands, political demands, um, and they and they have lost their way in so many places. How do I know? Just look at a given city. Uh, look at what the architecture is like. You can see it. It's, it's for all the world to see. And my question to you politically is: How do we get back to a better way? How do we get back to um, a, a city that's beautiful? that's resonant, that has underlying aesthetic values visible for the eye to see in every direction. This is so hard, but we have to do it. Absolutely, Jay. And that gets us perfectly to the next slide because we had this. I mean, I, I might be very overly romantic because I'm not uh, born American, but I grew up with uh, sort of an idealized romantic perception of America as, as a little kid playing with uh, land yachts and miniature version in the sandbox and having seen, you know, uh, magazines from, from America mid-century. And we have, again, I think we also, this is another claim of uh, correction from my side, because on this slide, we honor, which I, I've had to fly or I choose to fly over it. But here's Ron Lindgren, who we also had just Memorial Day. We can say this is also a Memorial Day um, um, uh, edition. Um, and Ron Lindgren is really one of the finest modern masters who has blessed us with the best of hospitality design, his firm. Uh, with a Kahala Hilton, then his Halikulani, down to the Ihilani, the Maunalani. And they different than, you know, the firms that you were indicating who basically, you know, took a big chunk of profit 
you know, have big mansions, oceanfront mansion. Not that we're jealous, you know. If if you do good work, you do deserve to be compensated. But there is something about, um, you know, the uh, the understatement, I would say, of respecting the island to say, well, I come and I try my very best and I have done with these projects, and then I go away again. And if I was good enough and I'm asked again, I come again. And that's what they basically did. And when they finally, after half a century, called it good, they didn't sell their firm uh, to stakeholders, shareholders, you know, corporations making a big buck. They just basically called it good. So I think in order to your question to see how we can get it back, we have to take a really close look to how it once was. And really, Ron, thank you. You're a very valuable witness, zeitgeist witness. And, you know, the column on the left is all the shows that you blessed us and, you know, the future generations with explaining the work you have done how you did it and why you did it. But the ones on the on the right are equally important because you were chipping in very courageously and, and joining us, what we're doing here and continue to do, Jay, and doing architectural criticism in, in a very, very, you know, um, serious and severe way and um, with, with no fear and having to point out the things as, as Kurt does and that gets us to the next slide um, with what you were throwing at us. We have the date here, 1st of May at 8.05. Jay Fidel sent to us, America's appetite for McMansions is devouring modern architecture from the Washington Post. And do you recall or use the images here to share with us what that article was about? I give you a hint. It's about Schwarzenegger. Or the Schwarzeneggers. He understands, doesn't he? Um, he's he's got a kind of global view, doesn't he? And he, uh, we we all and and that takes me to a point I wanted to make with you, Martin. And that is, um, this is not a subject, uh, a creative process uh, limited to a the architects, b the regulators in the planning departments. See the capital concentrations that can raise the hundreds of millions or billions it takes um, to build these structures. It takes the public too. They have to speak up. They have to criticize. You know, for example, one of the issues we've been talking about in other shows and r related subjects is if a court makes a decision, it's it's not for the public to just say, oh. You know, that's what they did. It's not for the media just to report what happened. Um, we all, as a larger community, have to speak out on it. We have to criticize it. We have to say, that's a terrible building. Okay, the other point I wanted to make is all along the same lines is this. It's, it's This is a moving target. The community changes. The wishes of people, the demographics change. The environment changes. Climate change enters the stage and changes. So all the players, including the architects, the regulators, and for that matter, the capital concentration, and, the, and those who would criticize architecture must also recognize the changes, which takes me to one last final point I want to make before you get back on. And that is this. You know, in Singapore, if a building passes a certain age, it has to be renovated or demolished. Um, because sometimes, you know, buildings, um, they have served uh, their purpose, they have served their useful life, and we have to replace them with something that's new and more resonant with the life in that community. Um, and I'm afraid that the capital concentrations would oppose that. The laws, the regulations really don't provide for that in the United States. Um, sometimes, by the way, you have to declare it as historic. Uh, and, and that's very important to have that there in that community. But you also have to knock it down if it's no longer serving an aesthetic and community purpose. So I think Singapore, as with so many other you know, urban planning issues, is right. Um, all buildings must be evaluated from time to time. There should be rules and regulations um, which, which say that it can't last forever. We have to replace it. You can't let it go. You know, there was an article in the paper this morning about Baltimore and how there are so many 
drug problems and street people problems. Part of that is the environment. The environment is old and frankly disgusting. And if you do that, what you have is a disgusting community. It attracts one feeds the other, if you will. And so you've got to rebuild. It's a statement by government to people saying, we care about you. We want to provide an environment you will like, you will you will uh, flourish in. Um, and um, we don't do that in so many places. And you can easily see the metric um, of a failed community because of a failed physical community. That, those are my thoughts. Also true. And it's lots of shades of gray in this. There is... Uh... We have to say there is an international, within the profession and the discipline of architecture, awareness of uh, the gray energy. So we're saying, you know, when we tear things down, um, we um, even if we do it with best intentions and I agree. And DeSoto and I, we have always been saying, if you tear something down, something good, you better replace it with something better, right? Because otherwise it's going to be de-evolution. And that is unfortunately the case while, you know, Arnie, yes, in, in the scope of American politics that you continue to report on with uh, several um, of your of your crew and with Tim Apicella first and foremost, Arnie is certainly someone that we would say, hey, you know, although maybe the political party he joined wasn't the one that we favored, but within that, He was doing pretty okay, and we almost would say, you know, and me being half Austrian, my mother being, and I'm very close to my motherland here, would say maybe if he would have had American citizenship to begin with born, then he could have been competing, which due to the Constitution, he cannot become American president. But even within him, so the article you were you were pointing out to me was, and I'm quoting here, a German uh, yellow press uh, article from the Bild-Zeitung. Have you ever heard about the Bild-Zeitung, Jay? No. The Bild-Zeitung is, is, is the most sort of, um, I guess, criticized. And I actually had my, my, my high school, my final high school exam was that we were all given a Bild-Zeitung. Uh, it's a tabloid, a yellow tabloid that has very, very sort of criticized uh, journalist styles. But even them, I mean, given that, and there is a lot of gossip in there, and you would in these days even call it conspiracy theories, but uh, we have to give them that they were uh, reporting on that, that uh, the daughter of Arnie Schwarzenegger with her Hollywood husband have uh, bought a lot with a house from a very famous mid-century modern master that Ron Lindgren in the show. We once did one, Jay, you remember what we called it cynical classicism when Trump was mandating that stupid style for federal buildings as a sort of a, 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 a degraded capitalism. And then we look back into if there is cultivated classicism. And so Ron was talking in that show. Please, you guys watch it again and listen to him where he explains that architect Craig Elwood. And, uh, you know, the uh, daughter of, of Arnie basically did the wrong thing because she tore it down with her husband to replace it with what is the next dimension with a McMansion. And there we have the point where you know, you shouldn't have done that because it's it's a building that is uh, stands for the best of its time for America when America was not, um, you know, doing what it's doing now in, in being ignorant and ostentatious and obnoxious, uh, both with political leaders and, you know, architecture has always been and will always be the, the embodiment of that, right, of the zeitgeist. So that, that is something that was criticized and we flew over and saying our university is not any better. Our leaders, my bosses who pay me, you know, I bite the hand that feeds me, I know. But if Sinclair Library is going to be gutted with a, with a budget of 50 million, um, that is something, you know, you almost waste all the gray energy. And with that, you waste also its, its cultural legacy. And it all seems basically fee and profit driven 
and and that is really a shame. So what what your point is is well taken, Jay. We should actually very carefully and educatedly look at what we have, and then say, okay, is is that really worth keeping? And if it is. Uh, then we have to keep it. And if it gets torn down, like in this case, it's great, as you say, that we have, uh, you know, public, the public, um, you know, being educated by the press, even by some very sort of low press as here, the Bild Zeitung, but they took it on as well and, 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 and many others and basically pointed out. And, and when, when, it's, when it's not worth keeping, uh, then it has to be replaced by something, um, you know, much, 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 much better. If you could do the next slide, that's number that's number five. It automatically reminded me of another case some years ago where um, the architectural firm of Skidmore Owings Merrill that blessed us with we show at the many with a five show quotes at the top left about the Mount Akea Beach Hotel, which is by Skidmore Owings Merrill. And then UH actually was one smart as well, go figure, because they also uh, uh, commissioned that very, very, um, you know, um, important firm, architectural firm at that time, and made it build the, uh, which is the engineering building, Richards Hall. So that we have on the island, but the house that one of the partners of Skidmore Owings Mellon, Gordon Bunch, have built for himself, which we see at the bottom right, which is the Travertine House, built in 62. Um, he basically uh, gave it to the Museum of Modern Art. And even institutions like that should be immune to the, I guess, the lure of capital concentration. They were not because they were selling it to Martha Stewart who then uh, sold it to this textile magnet, Donald uh, Meharam, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing him the right way, who then basically tore it down. And I'm, I'm sitting here in Bavaria and his explanation or excuse not really was that the way he found it was a Bavarian bathhouse. And I asked my wife, Suzanne, our exotic escapism expert, what that is. And she says, well, these are these houses are were built at the edge of the lake and people were using it to, for bathing reasons. And so he made the point, the house was sort of in a rundown, almost ruin-like condition, but then some experts, they're quoted here uh, from the Modern Architecture Working Group basically said it's not. So that is the point that, right, um, even sort of, you know, people, celebrities, right, important people, um, people that, the, the the normal people, the little people look up to, right? They all have a, a responsibility to um, understand what America's architectural silverware is, right? A house like that Travertine house is an icon and you don't tear down things like that. And um, then when you tear them down, that's the next slide, number six, gets us back to our island here. What do you basically build instead? And there's some, uh, this, this gets us along Kahala Road, which always reminds us of um, Florida somewhere. It's the most Floridian for me. And Florida is not just politically become increasingly the troubled tropics. And so is that Kahala Avenue when you see what's going to be built there left and right. And we always have our PIing mobile, our old Mercedes that used to be Gene Arioshi's car that we found out and just got to be confirmed by one of the Valet uh, friends of ours at the Holly Kalani Mark, who was basically confronting her and saying, hey, I have this architecture professor who claims to have your car. She's very suspicious. Uh, she's in her... 90s now and uh, and her husband is in close to 100 or he's already 100 so we're talking about the longest running governor that you remember very well and then when she was suspicious and said well someone is trying to sneak up on me you know it was probably like my car but then mark zoomed on to the sheep uh, uh, seat covers and she had to admit it was his it was her car because i kept it so we use this car as a, as our investigative mobile, and we always have the top down as to say we're in Hawaii, 
And um, never mind, you know, we should protect our holly skins, especially our bald heads, you and mine, Jay, right? To prevent it from skin cancer. But we should, you know, drive. If there's any any place in the world where convertibles should be almost the standard because you can also bring the top back up, right? It should be in Hawaii. You know, in Singapore, if your car gets beyond a certain age, you got to get rid of it or, or they will take it away from you one way or the mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and you know, there, there's a point in that because if you have cars that are newer, better, that follow the newer technology that you know that are hybrid or electric um this is a good thing so we want to motivate that but the other thing i wanted to add is that uh, you know, talk about what to do when a building gets old what to do when a community uh, you know needs to be re redeveloped okay and it's not always to build new stuff even if it's better stuff sometimes you have to take a fresh look at the, the whole urban plan. You have to build a park. Um, and this goes back to uh, Michael Kimmelman, you know, and public spaces, how important they are. When I came to Hawaii, which was in the 60s, there were many more parks, open spaces, public spaces than there are today. And the capital concentration we've been talking about tends to fill up those spaces. And what's really unfair is that in neighborhoods that are affluent, you have parks. In neighborhoods that are not so affluent, uh, affluent, you don't have parks or not as many. And I'm very troubled. You know, I drove through Kahala yesterday. I noticed there were a lot of parks there inside the neighborhood that for the neighborhood, for the people. And they it's not only a question of property values. You know, it's it's a question of quality of life to have a park nearby where you can play ball or take your kid, whatever it is. I also noticed that in Moili Ili, um, there's a lot of two, three story, you know, walk ups um, that are really not great architecture, never were, never will be. And they're being refurbished, rebuilt, replaced with more of the same um, because, you know, capital concentrations have bought them and figure they could do the same thing. And, you know, the way it works, you don't build a new building in Hawaii. You refurbish an old one. It's easier to get a building permit and all that. So Marie Ely Ely is going to look pretty much, you know, like it looked before. And the sad thing is this is happening all over Marie Ely Ely. And there are no new parks. It's the same deal as before. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that, um, you know, architects and planners and um, and regulators and capital concentrations and the public, the legislators, they have to be sensitive to this whole notion of renewal, of building open spaces. And you say making the building better than before. I say making the whole community better than before and rethinking the urban planning so that the quality of life is better. And I think we always have to keep that in mind. Right, Martin? We do. And and it's, it's when you see that picture, that slide number six and the, the bottom left part, this is actually talking Kahala. This is right at Triangle Park, which we know is an important park, you know, also for joggers who are jogging people who go and then turn around. And it's a park where, you know, kids play and, and all these things. But then someone builds this house just before the park. And when in the previous slide, the Travertine house um, was using uh, double T's or twin T's, which we have on the island by a great specific Rocky Mountain precast out there. They make them and they're used for parking garages and for bridges. But Gordon Bunshift was making a very interesting, having led to legacy house with it. And then you see this house in Kahala that I patrolled and I documented it over its um, construction. And it's like you'd like to say about things, it's junk. This is plywood. We're talking climate change. This is in the flood zone. So is there no brain to, to money anymore? That's another kind of a subtitle of our show, right? Because um, this is a multi-million dollar house in that location. 
but you build this out of plywood, give it the next tsunami, it's going to be gone. So this is, this is again, it's, it's unfortunately representing the zeitgeist of our times. When you look at Donald Trump that we don't want to talk about, but have to, and then he has this sort of weird kind of orange, you know, skin makeup on and whatever. That is the way people build buildings these days. And back in the days, buildings were built the Jimmy Carter way, you know, the unmasked, the real, the raw, the real deal, the honest way. And today it's faking things. And then you see this, we took this picture of this detail that there, which is on the right side of that construction out of, you know, plywood that they glue some looking like marble stuff on which is just really faking it so we also have to think about the values and the the show quote at the top left we might you know discuss with Kurt about Henry J Kaiser and certain things that he was you know not right but as far as his own house it's on the historic register it's at Portlock it was where the original Hawaii Five O, the first episode was filmed in, but it was aired as the fifth. And this is this is a house again that is um, that has integrity, that speaks for its time. It's it's not, I mean, for someone one of the richest guys. It's the same as with Shangri La, by the way, uh, decades before uh, with Doris Duke, right? Someone who was the the richest woman in the world built a relatively speaking decent and simple and humble house today the more money you have the more ugly it gets so i i think this is this is a real question jay to look at us as a culture and to reevaluate our values first of all uh and 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 go back to the roots of of america being humble but also very proud and patriotic at the same time and and really kind of reanimate these values as a culture and then that would automatically embody itself in humble but proud architecture again i believe or we throw this out as food for thought as always and um I think we got so excited about that we way exceeded our airtime here. So we got to stop it here only to pick it up from there next time because we want to send you away with this thought that even typologically, Jay, um, everything we've been talking about right now and illustrating, I take the blame for it, was actually single family residences. And uh, that typology itself might be one that we might want to reconsider because especially on our island but in fact in the world if every human being living and we're getting more and more of these would claim to have a single family residence we would have nothing else we will have no food to grow nowhere except in our front yard but no one not everyone wants to do that right so we and, and that is true for the whole globe but it's even more so true for our island of Oahu uh, in, in Hawaii, where we're basically squeezed in between two mountain chains. And we cannot afford anymore in our wrapping up ranting. You know, we were having this magazine from the 60s that was talking about paradise and pearl. I mean, that was in the 60s. And ever since then, it has not gotten better so as you and I talked and with DeSoto multiple times, like it or not, we actually got to go tall. And, and that is something we actually want to uh, shed a light on or you know, continue to shed a light on because the, the, the majority of developments um, are the urban developments that matter. And we should actually stop single family residences and because we have to stop sprawling and we have to build high. And how we do this in, in a way that um, is not turning people off because everyone loves to be the single family resident somewhere out there, right? And with no neighbors, but that's an illusion or only in, in an exclusive way, few can afford that. And then what about the rest? So we, we have to basically um, you look into the urban and that's what we will do next time when we get back together. Mm -hmm.